right. So now I'm going to uh, introduce you to a mystery uh, today. It's called the mystery of the unseen Messiah. John talks about this mystery in John chapter 1 verse 11. And he mentions that, talking of Jesus, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So have you ever read the gospel accounts? You know, I mean, there's four gospels. There's plenty of information there. And have you ever read them and wondered how it was, given all of the signs, wonders, miracles that Jesus did, that the nation as a whole did not see that he was the Messiah? Especially when we take into account what John writes at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry lasts about three, three and a half years. And right at the start in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So it started out good. People were responding well. Yet some 18 months later, when the crowd turned to the leaders of Israel and say, Can this be the son of David? Talking of Jesus, the religious leaders publicly declare it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. That's some transformation, isn't it? That's a significant shift. So today we're going to try and solve the mystery of the unseen Messiah. Now, of course, I'm not a detective, but I, I think I'm sort of qualified. I've read plenty of Sherlock Holmes. And seen plenty of movie mysteries, but apologies to all proper detectives. Obviously, I'm not one. So we're just going to follow some basic steps. And I'm, for today, I want you to imagine that you are members of the jury. Okay? And it, as it were, we're examining a cold case. A cold case is a historical event that we're going back and we're looking at the evidence to make a determination. Was the correct verdict achieved? And so we're going to be, we're going to be looking at the fact that I believe that the original verdict that was made by the leaders in Jesus' day to reject him, to not recognize him as a Messiah, I believe that was wrong. So what we're going to do is to, to prove this case and to identify that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Jewish Messiah, we're going to briefly look at a summary of the evidence from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, keeping in mind that that is the evidence that the people in Jesus' day already had. They had this evidence available to them. And we're going to show that, and make the case that, yes, Jesus is the promised or prophesied Messiah. As well as that, we're going to briefly add in some additional evidence that Jesus presented to them while he was here on earth in his first coming. We find that in the Gospels. Then we're going to look at the investigation that was undertaken into Jesus being the Messiah that was made by the religious leaders. We find that in the Gospels to understand why it was that despite all the evidence that they came to the conclusion that they would reject his claims to be the Messiah. And having presented the case for Jesus being the Messiah, I'm going to ask you as the jury to make your own verdict and understand the implications of that. So let's just now do a summary of the evidence. And the question I'm going to be asking today is one that Jesus posed himself to his disciples, and he says, but who do you say that I am? So when police are investigating a case, of course they need to gather the evidence. And in terms of who the Jewish Messiah needed to be, we actually have a large amount of evidence contained within the Hebrew Scriptures, that is the Old Testament. Now these were numerous prophecies made over several thousand years by many different people, and when they're put together, they create a very clear picture. It's a little bit like, think of a sketch artist. And they're talking to a witness, and the witness is describing someone, and they, they sketch out what that person looks like. That's a little bit like what we're doing here. We're getting a clear description from the witness of the Hebrew Scriptures as to who Messiah was to be. And of course, the evidence is substantial. We don't have time, unfortunately, to go through it all today. So these are just the highlights. So this table here contains a summary of evidence along with the Old Testament reference as well as references from the New Testament to show how Jesus fulfills each of these prophecies. 
So here is what we find. Firstly, he was to be born of the seed of the woman. That's right back in Genesis. Now, you might think, well, that's not particularly helpful, except it does contain a very important clue. You see, normally the Bible always speaks of the seed being from the man. So that saying it's from the woman was unusual. That meant something, but what did it mean? Well, actually, we didn't find out until the prophet Isaiah revealed that it meant that Messiah would be born of a virgin. So by having no biological father, Messiah would be born of the seed of the woman. That's what that phrase meant. Now, of course, that narrows our list significantly because not many people claim to be born of a virgin. The list isn't that long. So we can narrow it right down already just with that. But of course, we have other evidence to help further identify who Messiah could be. Because we also find from the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, that Messiah had to be a son, that is a descendant of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that means he had to be of the nation of Israel. So that we can rule, up, rule out every single other nation now. So not only born of a virgin, but of the, tri of the nation of Israel. That's good. But we can go even further than that, because then later on, Jacob promised that Messiah would be of the tribe of Judah. So now that rules all 11 other tribes out. We're down to one tribe. Then following that, a, little bit, a few centuries later, the prophet Nathan told David that one of his descendants would be this promised Messiah. So now we've got right down to one household, the household of David. But he can add even more to that because then Jeremiah rules out one branch of the house of David. It was said that uh, no descendant of Jeconiah could ever sit on the throne of David. Now, if you're not aware, Matthew's genealogy of Joseph reveals he was, in fact, a direct descendant of Jeconiah. So Jesus being by Joseph's biological son, he actually would have been ruled out from sitting on David's throne. So he couldn't have been the promised Messiah if that had been the case. So that brings us right back to that first prophecy of the seed of the woman that is being born of a virgin. Because that meant he avoided the Jeconiah curse. And Luke's gospel, which gives us Mary's genealogy, shows us that Jesus was still a biological descendant of King David through the different, a different line, one that did not include Jeconiah, and that was Mary's line. And she was also a descendant of King David. So he still qualifies as being a descendant of the house of David. But we can e even add more details to the picture because alongside the ancestry requirements, we also have other requirements that Messiah had to fulfill such as being born in the small village of Bethlehem in Judea. Now, that's a pretty small place. And I don't know about you, but did you get a choice as to where you were born? No. And in fact, had it not been for a census, which forced them to have to relocate temporarily to Bethlehem, where would Jesus have been born? Nazareth. God intervened. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Okay, we can add more to that. We also have the fact that uh, he would be connected to a specific star. This is Jacob also speaks of this, which was to be a symbol of his kingship. And interestingly, he was also prophesied to be born at a time when the house of David was in a state of poverty. So rather than a glorious ruling family, it would be a family rather in abject poverty. In other words, they were down and out. Also, we can add to that, uh, with all of these descriptions of his humanity, the fact that Messiah would also be the Son of God. This is also in the Hebrew Scriptures. That is, he would be divine. And finally, we can, from the prophet Daniel, we can get a specific timeline which it tells us that when Messiah was to arrive, and he would have to arrive before a specific moment in history, that being the destruction of the temple. That's in 70 AD. So from Matthew we understand the Magi from Babylon were able to work out Daniel's timeline. They appeared looking for Jesus. So again, all of that evidence that I've just quickly summarized there, all of that evidence in the Hebrew Scriptures was already available in Jesus' day. They already knew it. So members of the jury, here's what you are looking for. You're looking for a Jewish male of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David, but not of the line of Jeconiah, born of a virgin in Bethlehem of Judea, at a time when the house of David was to be in poverty, and who makes the claim to be the son of God, or put it around the other way, claims that God is his father. All within a very specific time frame given by the prophet Daniel. Folks, 
Jesus matches the description perfectly. And he is the first person in, recorded in history to make the public claim to the nation of Israel to be the Jewish Messiah. Now, false messiahs did appear, but only after Jesus. Now, in addition to this evidence from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament that, Jesus, uh, that we've been given, Jesus himself, in John 5, verse 31 to 39, outlines four more additional pieces of evidence that had actually been given alongside that during his ministry to authenticate the claims he was making. And the first, of course, is John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist had publicly declared to everybody who was listening at the time that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Only God could deal with sin. So he was basically saying Jesus is divine. He is God's answer to humanity's problem of sin. We can, we've got more evidence, though. We also have the voice from heaven. There's, there's about three recorded instances of a voice from heaven. And the first one is that is baptism. It's called a but kol in, Jeff, in Hebrew thinking or Jewish thinking. And it's a very, considered a very authoritative uh, piece of evidence. And that voice had proclaimed concerning Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if he's saying Jesus is his son, that by implication, the Father. God the Father is saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We can add more than that. We also have the messianic miracles that he performed along with the normal everyday garden variety miracles. He also had messianic miracles. He did that they believed in that time period only Messiah could do. We won't go through all of those. If you're interested, I can talk to you afterwards. But we have that additional evidence as well. That's what got their attention when he did Messianic miracles. And added to that even more, of course, Jesus had already fulfilled many Messianic prophecies found in the Old Testament in his lifetime. While he's doing his ministry, prophecies are being fulfilled. Remember in this synagogue, he says, this is being fulfilled in your presence, speaking of Isaiah 61. So you can see, tick, 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 this is all additional evidence that he's giving on top of the vast quantity of evidence from the Hebrew Scriptures. But of course, we're still left with the question, aren't we, members of the jury, as to why they did not see that he was the Messiah. So to understand that, we need to examine the investigation that they undertook into Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. We find this in their Gospels. And this is, actually, there's two investigations recorded in the New Testament, one of John the Baptist, which comes before the one of Jesus. So that's how we know that they went about doing these investigations. And so this is the one concerning John, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? They're investigating him. They want to know who he is. So this is part of a three-stage process that we find in the Gospels, that the religious leaders undertook to investigate, firstly John, but then Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. And we find there were three stages, observation, interrogation, and proclamation, or making a verdict. And so we see the same process. as They, they undertook the first two stages with John the Baptist as well. Of course, there was some key difference. Firstly, John did not claim to be the Messiah. And also, secondly, he was arrested by Herod before the leaders were able to complete the third stage of making the verdict. So they never completed the investigation because he was arrested and then beheaded. But I will reference those if you're interested. As we go through, I'll reference the investigation to John as we look into the investigation of Jesus. So let's look at stage one, observation. Now, during this stage, a delegation was sent to observe the person whom they were investigating. Interestingly, they were not permitted during this stage to ask questions or raise objections. They were simply to observe what was being said and done. Eyes only. You know, I've got a seven-year-old, and sometimes I have to tell him, no hands, eyes only. You know, just watch, don't touch. Because whatever it is, it would be dangerous if you touched it. Well, in this case, it's not about danger, but it's about them listening and not speaking. We see this occurs after Jesus heals a Jewish man of leprosy, which in that day was considered a, a messianic miracle. That is a miracle only Messiah could do. And when he heals this man, he says, go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded 
for a proof to them. What are, they, what are they proving? What is this proving to the priests? That Jesus is the Messiah. He's giving them evidence. He is who he claims to be. And actually, in response to this miracle, they start the investigation into Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. As he's making a claim, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. Now they're investigating. We see this mentioned in Luke chapter 5, verse 17. And he was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee. That makes sense. But it also goes on to say, and Judea, and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with them to heal. So notice that in this case, we see it's not just locals who are coming to see Jesus. This group includes people coming to Galilee from Jerusalem. Now, folks, that's a three-day walk. That's not an accidental turn off to the left. And oops, I didn't mean to go that way. Three days journey walking means I got there because I wanted to be there. All right? So that actually is evidence that they'd sent a delegation to observe Jesus. The fact that this is the observation stage can be seen in the non-verbal responses to Jesus' claim in the same setting when he says he is able to forgive sins. This is prior to them, him then going on to heal the lame man. When he says he's able to forgive sins, the Pharisees and the scribes begin to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But notice what it says. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? This is backed up by a parallel account in Matthew, which says, The scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Why do you think evil in your hearts? You notice what it's identifying here. They're not saying this out loud. They're thinking it internally because Jesus knows what they're thinking. And Mark's account says similar things. Jesus then goes on to proceed the lame man, uh, to heal the lame man, sorry. And that, of course, then backs up the claim he's made to be able to heal sins. All right, so he's backing up this, this claim to authority. Now, following, it, following this, it seems that the delegation then returns to Jerusalem, takes the three-day journey back, and they determine, yes, Jesus' messianic claim is worth investigating. And so we conclude the first stage of investigation and enter the second gate stage of interrogation. And this is the one you're probably more aware of. Now that lasts for about 18 months. And everywhere where Jesus goes, there is a Pharisee popping up to ask him questions, making comments to test him, all with the purpose to find out whether Jesus is the promised Messiah or not, so they can make their verdict. Interestingly, during this time, the, re the Gospels record three consecutive debates between Jesus and the Pharisees over the correct way to observe the Sabbath. See, in temple times, of course, the temple was at number one. That was the thing of most importance. But a close second was the Sabbath. And so a conflict arose over the authority of what we're going to call today the Pharisees' oral law traditions. And what were those? Those were thousands of oral laws and regulations that had been added in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you want to find out where that is, if you, your Bible might have a blank page. That's 400 years worth of time. All right? And in those 400 years, they'd added to the original 613 commandments found in the written law of Moses thousands of rules. For example... To that one command to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the Pharisees had added over one and a half thousand new oral rules and regulations. Mm. So they thought this was a good idea. They thought this is like a fence that's going to, so people could break these oral laws, that, but at least, at least they're not breaking the written law. That's what they were thinking. That's what they were hoping to achieve. But then they made some. Critical errors, you see, because in about 30 BC, they decided that all of these oral law traditions were now compulsory for every Jewish person to keep. They started teaching that these actually had divine origins. They didn't, but they started teaching that they did. And so these were believed by the Pharisees to be equal in authority to the written word of God. They saw them, that these had come from God as well. And keeping these oral law traditions they saw as a means 
of achieving a divine standard of righteousness. But controversy ensues because Jesus rejects both. Be, Jesus re- rejects both their points, revealing that far from protecting the written law, the law of Moses, these man-made oral law traditions were in fact breaking the very law they were supposed to protect. He answered and said, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? He also rejected the belief that their oral laws had any divine authority saying, you leave the commandment of God, that's the written word, and hold to the tradition of men. So he does not see these as having divine authority. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. He also rejected their belief that those traditions, human-derived traditions, somehow achieved a divine standard of righteousness. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus uses the topic of the Sabbath to show his authority as Messiah, even stating, for the Son of Man, speaking of himself, is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't in the authority over him, but in his divine, his divinity, he had authority over the Sabbath. And he demonstrates his authority by consistently breaking these oral law traditions that they'd made up. For example, one they had was that no one was permitted to be healed on the Sabbath. So unless it was a life or death instance, no one could be healed. And and several times he heals someone on the Sabbath. And so what he does is he observes the Sabbath as it is written. That is, as it's written in the law of Moses. And so he consistently breaks the oral law traditions, which are not found in Mosaic law. Notice he never breaks the law of Moses, only their oral law traditions. And as a result of these conflicts over the Sabbath, they start persecuting him. And eventually the Pharisees take counsel with the Herodians. Now these people at the end of the split, so this would be like ACT and the Green Party going, hey mate, how's it going? These people don't normally have anything in common, politically, right? But even worse than that, these these guys were even more, you know, this is even further apart. What I'm giving you is sort of like a mild version. These guys hated each other. And yet, they hated Jesus even more. So much so, they were happy to join up to see how they might destroy him. So because Jesus had rejected their traditions, they now reject him and his teaching. And this is why they reject his claim to be the Messiah. And the result of that conflict over the Sabbath was that this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Right. So, Notice when it says breaking the Sabbath in that context, it's referring to him breaking the oral law traditions, not the written Moses, Mosaic law. Okay, so one of the things that you need to understand is the significant impact all of these oral traditions had on the society that Jesus is presenting himself to as Messiah. Because the majority were Pharisees, and they believed Messiah would be a Pharisee just like that. And he would keep all of these traditions. Instead, Jesus rejects these traditions, only affirming the law of Moses as it is written, not as it had been reinterpreted by the various rabbis and sages. In fact, he points out that this process had gone un- undergone of turning human traditions into commands, divine commands or cl- claimed divine commands, had actually been prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah said, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Why? Because they teach as doctrines the commandments of men. So having presented proof of his divine authority, Jesus instead taught the truth that if anyone wants to enter the kingdom, rather than keeping these Pharisaic traditions, they must be born again. Jesus 
talking to Nicodemus, said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That requires that us, us as individuals place our faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus also went on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him is all condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So people of the jury understand that they rejected him because he rejected their teaching. So they in turn, it was a little bit of a tit, tit, tit for tat, so to speak. And we can also look at the Pharisees and think, oh, how foolish they would be to be duped into believing that these human traditions were divine and believe those instead of the word of God. Missing something so clearly, so obvious, that Jesus is the Messiah. And folks, that reminds me of the famous mystery duo of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Is everyone familiar with them? Okay, so one day they decided to go on a camping trip. And after a pleasant dinner, they settled down for the night and drifted off to sleep. But some hours later, Holmes startled awake. And he nudged his friend Watson. He said, hey, look up to the sky. Tell me what you see. Watson replied, I, I see millions of stars. Holmes says, well, what does that tell you? Watson pondered for a minute and then with an impressed look on his face with himself said, well, astronomi astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. And metrologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. <laughs> what does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes was silent for a moment and then spoke. Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> It's all too easy to miss the obvious, isn't it? So again, before we get too high and mighty with the Pharisees, we should stop and consider our own position. Make sure that we aren't ourselves falling into exactly the same trap, be that church traditions or social or cultural demands are placed on us that somehow become sacred, become must-dos, even though they're not even found in Scripture. And that's what Paul is talking about when he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy at empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So let's now move to our third and final stage, the, the public verdict. So following this 18-month interrogation, now the Sanhedrin were ready to make their public verdict concerning Jesus Messiahship. Interestingly, Mark's account reveals that once again, when this happens, the scribes have come down from Jerusalem, so they've done that three-day turn off to the side, down to, uh, down to Galilee, sorry, from Jerusalem. And their public verdict? Jesus is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. So they're attributing the works of the Holy Spirit being done by the Messianic Son of God to Satan. You can't get any more removed from the truth than that. And this rejection results in an immediate change in Jesus' ministry. And he brings in the mystery kingdom. That is something that was unseen in the Old Testament. And now he only starts to speak publicly in parables. And what these parables tell us, they give us the outworking of the mystery kingdom that we are still in. And that is what happens here on earth while the king is in heaven. That's what the parables explain. What happens here on earth while the, the king, the Messiah and king, is in heaven? And that national rejection of the generation of that day as Jesus is the Messiah, by rejecting him as a Messiah and king, also means he removes the offer of the Messianic kingdom, which had been at hand. And now he starts calling them this evil generation. And so instead of the kingdom that they would they were supposed to receive, they will enter into judgment. And now the kingdom will be given to a future generation. A generation 
of the tribulation who will accept one in coming day Jesus is their Messiah and King. This is the generation Paul speaks of saying that all Israel will be saved. That's a future tense comment. He's talking about that generation. Finally, there will be a generation in the future who do see him, who do recognize Jesus as their Messiah. But let's come back to our initial question. Why did they miss him the first time? Why did they get it so wrong? Why, as Jesus puts it, did they not know the time of their visitation? Well, people of the jury, I hope you've seen that the problem is not a lack of evidence. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees identifies the problem. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But you do not believe his writing. How will you believe my words? Now hold on. Surely no one believed Moses more than the Pharisees, right? But the key word here is writings. They believed Moses in the way that Moses had been reinterpreted through their oral law traditions. All they could see now was their own traditions and rules. And consequently they failed to recognize their Messiah when he came to them. Why? Because they were testing him through the prism of Pharisaic traditions rather than by the truth of God's word. And that explains why Jesus came to his own, his own people did not receive him. The people of the jury, what is your verdict? Let us not make the same mistake. Let no one delude you with plausible arguments found in various human ideologies and philosophies. Let your verdict be determined by the truth of God's word. So again, let's return to that question. Jesus asks his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And folks, that's probably the most important question that each of us have to answer. And I hope that you can see the evidence all points to the fact that Jesus is indeed the Jewish Messiah. Not only did he match the description perfectly required by the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures, his life and ministry also contained even more evidence, all of which means that we with Peter can answer Jesus' question of who do you say that I am with the response, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And given that is true, what then are the implications here are Jesus' words. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. All of those prophecies concerning Messiah's first coming had a literal fulfillment in Jesus' life. And that's recorded in the Gospels. And folks, that is the basis for faith. Firstly, for any unbeliever here today, so there is John puts it, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have faith, have, sorry, life in his name. But there is also the basis for belief in the believer's life, in your walk of faith. If you are a believer here today, this is the foundation for your faith, your walk of faith. You have a life of faith, now you have a walk of faith. And Paul puts it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I hope, folks, gentlemen and ladies of the jury, that you see who Jesus really is. And if you haven't, that you place your faith in him. And if you have, that others see clear evidence of him in your life that they too could convict you of being someone who follows Jesus because there would be enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he is your saviour. Let's pray and then we're going to finish with a song. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that points so clearly to the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray for anyone here today who hasn't entered into that relationship with you that by the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you draw them to yourself. Bring that lost sheep back to yourself, Lord. They'd come to know the truth, and the truth would set them free.
for all here today who do believe in you. May they be encouraged to know they serve a risen Saviour and he works in their lives today and that they would have the faith to live lives which reflect the fact that they live and serve for a risen Saviour. We ask this in Jesus' name.